Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to New Books and Mathematics, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Corey Brunson, a host of the channel. I'm talking today with Dr. Ellen Peters, author of the new book, Enumeracy in the Wild, Misunderstanding and Misusing Numbers, published last year, 2020, by Oxford University Press. Enumeracy has long been a recognized problem for individual and collective decision-making. We act on numeric information every day in ways that affect our physical, social, and financial well-being. And civic institutions, including formal education, journalism, government, and healthcare, must communicate this information to a public with an often limited bandwidth for it. This book brings an extensive literature to bear on questions of how our numeracy affects our lives and what we can do to improve it. It is extremely well organized and makes a solid resource or course text. But by thoughtfully explaining and illustrating concepts, also makes itself available to interested readers, like myself, outside the field. It's my pleasure to be talking with the author today. Ellen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Corey. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you. And I wonder if you could begin by giving a brief overview of your own scientific training, and in particular, your interests in mathematics and mathematical literacy. Sure, absolutely. So um, growing up, uh, I had three brothers, and we used to play a ton of math games. And all four of us, in the end, graduated college with engineering degrees. Um, And for me, it was, um, I I just, I loved math. Math problems were fun. They were interesting. They were just like these little puzzles to solve. But I, so I went on to engineering school and I got an engineering degree. I even worked for an enge- as an engineer for a couple of years after that. But I ended up finding myself just much more curious about what people think and what, how people behave and, and how they make decisions because it often looked so odd to me. And it was, I was more curious about that than what machines and chemicals do. Um, because of that, after a couple of career shifts, um, this sort of helped me figure out what I liked to do and what I didn't like to do. Uh, I ultimately ended up going back and getting a PhD in psychology, and I focused on risk perception and decision making. And so that that's essentially my scientific training. It's a little bit of a hodgepodge of things that led me in the end um, to study what I think is an enormously interesting topic around numeric ability and decision making. So you describe shifting your focus from machines and objects to persons, which is interesting that you ended up on the topic of mathematics, which tend, we tend to think of going in the opposite direction. So tell me a little bit more about how you came to write this book and maybe include a comment, if you would, on your work with the Institute of Medicine. Oh, certainly. Um, so, so I ended up writing the book because we, I had been doing research on numeracy and decision making uh, for more than 10 years at that point. And I still found the topic really interesting. And there was more and more research that existed out there, but nobody had pulled it together. And I had always had a desire to write a book. I didn't know it was going to be about math ability and decision making, but it was a a great topic at that point in my life. And so that's how I ended up choosing to write the book. Um, I've written extensively on the topic, uh, you know, in, in, peer-reviewed publications, in public pieces. Um, The the Institute of Medicine piece came in because I was commissioned by the Institute of Medicine um, to take a look at what are the implications of numeracy for the Affordable Care Act. So this was back um, towards the very beginning of the Affordable Care Act. And what they were interested in is, um, is it possible that with a whole new Um, set of patients coming into our health system through the Affordable Care Act, because suddenly they're allowed to have health insurance, what are they going to look like? What are the communication issues going to be? Are are they going to be different from the the patients who've been in the system before this? And in fact, people um, who didn't have health insurance prior to the Affordable Care Act actually are less numerate than the people who already had health insurance prior to the Affordable Care Act. And so the communication issues are the idea that these patients, if they're lower in numeric ability, um, healthcare providers like physicians and, and other and um, and other people need to just pay more attention to how they're communicating to make sure that they can actually understand and use the information. So, taking that into account, you're clear in the preface about your main goals with the book, and I wondered if you could also say what audience this book is intended for. Whom are you writing to here? Excuse me. Yeah. So I'm actually writing the book primarily for academic researchers like myself, researchers who are interested in numeracy and decision making. 
what, what I hope is that it'll, it will also be useful to researchers who are in related fields, like in medicine or political science or the environment, um, who, who want to better understand how the public, again, understands and uses critical numeric information, because numbers are often very important. Um, I also hope it'll be um, valuable to people who are really good at math already, but they can't figure out what the less numerate people around them are doing. Um, and maybe even to less numerate people who want to do better, because I try to give some tips along the way for how to figure out some of the um, um, some of the ways that people present numbers or some of the decisions that are kind of thrust upon us, but that have numbers in them, but less numerate people don't tend to use them well. Frankly, as a mathematician, I saw myself, as you prompt the reader to several times in the book to think about whether you see people you know or perhaps yourself, I did see myself several times, sometimes from the, uh, as one of the case studies of someone who's more numerate, but sometimes in those concerning less numerate people. So I felt somewhat challenged and at the same time validated by reading about the struggles that people have and what the methods are. We'll get to this at the end of the discussion uh, to hone one's own numeracy. But to begin with, uh, in your first section, section one, you identify three types of numeracy or three types of innumeracy. Uh, the differences are essential to understanding the rest of the book. So I'd like to start at the, to ask here at the outset how they differ from each other and how they're measured. Yeah. So, okay. So there are three types um, and I'll name them first and then I'll describe them briefly. So there's objective numeracy, there's subjective numeracy, and then there's this very evolutionarily, evolutionarily old intuitive number sense that we have. So uh, objective numeracy is, is what we normally think about when we think about math ability. It's the ability to understand and use basic prob probabilistic concepts and, and other kinds of mathematical concepts. And we measure it with a math test. And so when we measure it with a math test, we, we give them a set of math problems and we simply count up the total number of correct responses. Um, the, you know, the measures that, ex that exist out there are often focused on probabilistic uh, questions. They sometimes include some algebra or some arithmetic. Um, one of the most common measures comes from Isaac Lipkis and his colleagues, and it's really focused on, uh, on things like understanding risk magnitudes, um, understanding percentages and proportions. Um, how do you convert a percentage to a proportion? Uh, so, so an easy question um, from, from that particular measure is, and it's a super easy question, which of the following numbers represents the biggest risk of getting a disease? And then participants are asked to choose one of three responses, 1%, 10%, or 5%. Now, you know the answer to that, and I know the answer to that, but, but not everybody does. It, it's, a pretty easy, it's a pretty easy question. Um, about 83% of U.S. adults get that answer that question correctly, but that does mean that 17% of U.S. adults, and this is a nationally representative sample, weren't able to answer the question correctly. Um, if you want to know about it, uh, a harder question, um, and this is about a, a conversion kind of question, the chance of winning a car is one in a thousand. What percentage of tickets win a car? This one is actually pretty hard for people because you have to know the rule of how many digits to move it over. And it's just, it, people have a tough time with it. Um, and only, it, the correct answer is 0.1%, but only about 24% of U.S. adults were able to answer that correctly um, in a representative sample of U.S. of U.S. adults. Yeah, it took them. I took a moment actually registering the, the two facets of that question. Like one, just interpreting what the question was asking, and then two, figuring out how many decimal points over I needed to move. So is, does that reflect two sort of components of the uh, of our numeric ability that need to be that are separated by some of these studies? So, you know, I'm often asked that question about should we be trying to separate out different components of mathematical ability and does it make a difference to decision making? And intuitively, I think there are these different components. But I have to tell you, when we've looked for them in studies, we haven't found that it makes much of a difference. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to have more to do, and maybe this is the result of how the U.S. education system teaches math. But from everything we can look at, if when we've separated out difficulty from type of math, for example, it's just the difficulty. It's the difficulty of the question that matters. So if you have, um, if you have like probability questions and arithmetic questions, and they're equally hard, it doesn't make a difference whether it's about probability or 
um, about probability or mm. about arithmetic. It's about the difficulty of the problem. And so I, I think there's a lot more research that can be done in here because I suspect nonetheless that your intuition and mine are correct and that it does make a difference what type of math you're looking at or in the way that you expressed your question, even what component of math we're talking about. But I have not seen or, or produced good data to, to, to show me that, yeah, that's true. Instead, I've seen, I, I haven't seen it. And I inter- interrupted um, your flow. So if you wanted to continue with uh, your discussion of that, of that question. Oh, sure. So you asked about three types of numeracy. We talked about objective numeracy. The next type is subjective numeracy. And this has to do with, um, with, with uh, it actually does have two components depending on how you measure it. But it has to do with people's confidence in their ability to understand numbers and to use mathematical concepts. Um, in my work, I often call that component something, uh, I call it numeric self-efficacy. And then in some measures, there's this other component that has to do with preferences for numbers. Um, and so the, uh, so this kind of a measure is measured with self-report scales. Um, the most popular measure comes from um, a, a fantastic colleague of mine named Angie Fagerlin um, and a set of her colleagues like Brian Zickman Fisher. And it has questions, um, I mean, literally asking, how good are you at fractions? Um, or how good are you at calculating a 15% tip? And people just answer that on scales from not at all good to extremely good. And you either average them or sum them up and you use that as a scale um, when you're then looking at how well people understand numbers or they use numbers in judgments and decisions. And and then there's um, the the third type of numeracy that that I talk about in the book is this idea of an intuitive number sense. Um, We have this really, really interesting these really interesting intuitions about numbers um, that emerge from what's called the approximate number system. Um, And it's usually shortened as ANS. So hopefully I can, if that's okay to use. Sure, Um, and we'll come back to it later in the discussion. Okay, awesome. So so the ANS itself is, it's a system for representing approximate quantities that are bigger than three or four. So you have to get to the number four or five before the approximate number system sort of handles uh, representations of numbers. The quantities it represents don't rely on language or symbols. Like it it doesn't rely on like an Arabic number six or a written out number four. Instead, um, it it relies on on what we call non-symbolic numbers, like sets of dots. So if you can imagine a domino uh, with six dots on it, it's representing numbers in in that kind of fashion. And it's this just evolutionarily old sense of how big is a quantity. Using this intuitive number sense, um, human animals, but also non-human animals, can can discriminate quickly between numeric differences between uh, between two numbers. So for humans, we can um, discriminate quickly between mortgage rates or numbers of M&Ms or whatever the quantity is. And we can make very fast numeric estimates. Um, When it comes to humans, people who discriminate more precisely using this approximate number system, they actually seem to perceive numbers to be further apart and more different from each other than people who are worse at this, um, who are worse at these um, approximate, uh, at this approximate number system. And so before jumping into some of the specific studies that examine differences in people's numeric ability along these scales, We've been talking about a few examples, the the educational system, mortgage rates, uh, that are in some cases specific to the United States. And that's the the area of focus for a lot of this research, because I assume a lot of these researchers live in the U.S. or work in the U.S. Yeah, that's true. And so there's this one uh, way in which the United States is often unfavorably compared to other industrialized countries, which is student math scores. And so as one question to get us thinking about the population impacts of of numeracy. How enumerate are we as a country? Um, What are some memorable data points and how do we compare to other countries? Yeah, so um, if you look at data from the um, the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, they have done quantitative literacy or numeracy tests across, I think about 32 countries. And if you look only, and then what they do is they they categorize people in terms of have uh, in terms of levels of numeracy that start with one and go all the way up to five. Um, what they end up finding um, in the U.S. specifically is that almost a third of our population, twenty nine percent of U.S. adults, can do only very simple processes with numbers. They can count. They can sort. They can do simple arithmetic, and they can do they can use simple percentages like fifty percent. 
but they can only do even those simple processes if there's not many words around them distracting them or not other material material around them distracting them from the numbers. And in the U.S., this is about 73 million people. And what this means for them, for, for this very low level of numeracy, is they, they probably can't do some things that, that companies, for example, think that we can all do. They, they probably can't select um, a health plan with the lowest cost based on annual premiums and deductibles. They probably can't figure out that they can't pay off a credit card debt based on how much money they owe and what the monthly, the minimum monthly payment and annual percentage rate is. They, they probably can't figure out those kind of things. You, you can even consider the next 33% of people. This is people who are considered having level two numeracy. Um, you can consider them to be relatively enumerate. They, they almost certainly can't do things like estimate the total annual cost of a health plan that, in ways that include premiums and co-pays and deductibles. Again, sort of an everyday task that I think a lot of companies um, and, and, other, and other institutions think everybody can do, but a lot of people actually can't do it. Um, when you look at the very highest levels of numeracy, um, about 9% nine per, nine of, of U.S. adults um, have what are considered, they actually combine across level four and level five, but about 9% of people are, are at that level four or five of numeracy. And um, for this, I, you mentioned earlier the, the Institute of Medicine. One of the things that we did for that Institute of Medicine report is we we're trying to estimate for them uh, what kind of tasks could people do in each of these levels of numeric ability. And so at this very highest level, this 9% level, we think that it's only this 9% of U.S. adults who could do all of the numeric tasks that are involved in a chronic disease like diabetes. Because diabetes is a really highly numeric disease that has to do with understanding glucose meter readings, um, titrating medications, adjusting insulin, depending upon how much carbohydrate you're taking in or how much exercise you're doing. And so, so those are some of the things that come out of the OECD data. Um, if you, if you want to think about um, more concrete tasks that have been done across different studies, um, there's, there's a really interesting um, researcher named Russell Rothman who looks at diabetics. And so he does a lot of research with, um, with numeracy and diabetes. And he's, he's shown, for example, that um, in, in the population he was studying, only 27% of people could calculate the number of carbohydrates in a 20 ounce bottle of soda with two and a half servings. But that's a task that di diabetics need to be able to do because they need to monitor their carbohydrate level very, very, um, very well. Um, another study uh, found that about 40% of Americans, only about 40% of Americans can figure out when to take a missed medica medication dose that they need to take two to three hours after a meal but they weren't able to figure it out. About 40%, only about 40% could figure it out. And so you get these very, um, you know, it, it, you get these very difficult, a lot, a lot of difficulties with numeric ability that exist in the population and that I think go unrecognized by a lot of people. You're leading very directly into a question I was about to ask, which is that while a lot of this research focuses on very specific incidences or especially these example questions that are given, you might think that these are trivial things that people may, may or may not be able to do, but you point out several times in the book that these effects on real world decisions can compound over time. And so I wonder if you could elaborate on that here. Yeah, sure. So, you know, what I think happens is that no one, like you were saying, each one of these questions in some ways is very trivial. So what if someone can't figure this out on the fly? It'll be fine. You know, they'll, they'll kind of make do and life will go and life will go on. Um, but I think it, I, I think it might be kind of like smoking one cigarette. I think, you know, if, if you smoke one cigarette, it doesn't make any difference. Smoking one cigarette has essentially no impact on your life. It's a cigarette. Who cares? It's like this little thing. The problem is that if you smoke one cigarette and then you smoke another and then you smoke a pack and then you smoke five more packs, that those that that one cigarette at a time um, seems to compound and end up with just huge, tremendous negative impacts on the body. And I think something similar, maybe not that huge, but something similar, I think, might happen with might happen with numeracy, where people who are less numerate make a single mistake that you know really doesn't matter that much in the moment, but over time. If you continue to make lots and lots of little mistakes, they may compound and ultimately end up um, end up so that you are making lots of worse decisions over time, and you ultimately end up with less um, with worse health and financial outcomes and worse well being. 
And so it's that, I think there's a cumulative risk of innumeracy. So getting into some of the the discussion of these measures of numeracy in Section 2, I don't think we have time to go through a bunch of examples, but I would like to tackle one. So for example, um, you look at numeric inconsistency, one of the topics of this chapter, through a study that used what's called the standard gambling task. So could you talk a little bit about this kind of this kind of research? Yeah. So um, sometimes researchers or policymakers um, want to understand the value of different health states. And the study you're referring to is, is done by some physicians, actually. And they're interested in what's called um, measurements of health utility. Um, the problem is that measuring utility can be really difficult. One of the classic methods that's used is what you mentioned. It's this standard gam- gamble task. And w- what happens in these tasks is that participants are told to choose between living in a particular health state for the next 10 years, and that health state is described to them, or take a gamble of a painless treatment that has a chance of death, but otherwise guarantees for perfect health. And so, it, I mean, it literally is a, a, gam- a gamble with health that, um, that, pe- that people are taking. Um, and what, what these researchers were interested in is, okay, that's one measure of health utility. And, and I should mention, by the way, that um, health utility measures are intended to assess the burden of disease, especially for chronic disease patients. And w- what you can do is you, you can do things like look before and after some intervention to see if the intervention helped or not. So if you see an increase in health utility, the intervention helped. If you see a decline, you can see the, the intervention, in fact, hurt. So that, that's the idea behind it. So the standard gamble task is is one of the the classic measures. There are other ones too, though. And what these researchers were interested in is they wanted to compare, okay, these are all measures of health utility. They should all be the same. Are they the same for everybody? And does that change depending on people's numeracy? So they had people do the standard gamble task, but then they had them rate the same health states using um, two other methods. One of their other methods is called a visual analog scale. And it's essentially a thermometer from um, where zero is death and 100 is perfect health. And people are asked to rate how they feel about some particular health state. So you have a line on a sheet of paper and you mark how far from one end of the line to the other you rate the importance or the... Exactly. I mean, you think, think about it more like a thermometer going up and down um, okay. so that so, and, and, higher is, and higher is better. So very but, but much that, a visual thermometer. Very much a visual thermometer, exactly, yeah. And so the idea is both of these should measure health utility, and and you want to be able to measure health utility because you want to find out if your interventions help or hurt, your your health interventions. And what they found was that um, it was just very imperfect. Um, And so people who are highly numerate did pretty well in terms of of rating their rating these different health states pretty similarly across the the two measures but people who are less numerate were very inconsistent they 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 actually didn't they, they just rated the, the same health state very differently depending upon how you ask them numerically another topic you address in this section is framing effects and i specifically wanted to ask about this because it seems especially relevant to public health communications. So similarly to your, um, your work with the IOM, I wonder if you have thoughts on how communicators have explained or could explain concerns like infection risk, vaccine effectiveness, and adverse events, things that are in the news all the time in the midst of this pandemic. Yeah, so, so framing effects are the idea that you can describe the exact same thing in positive terms, 90% survival, or in negative terms, 10% mortality. So you can have a positive frame or a negative frame on something. And the, the numbers are logically identical. It's the same thing. The issue is that people, including experts, by the way, they tend to feel worse when things are described in negative frames, like that, that 10% mortality. And they feel better, they feel more positively if, it, if it's described in a positive frame, like the 90% survival. Um, during the pandemic, for example, if you want to talk about like infection rates, during the pandemic, most numbers have been described in negative frames, the percent infected the, 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 or the number infected even and the number of deaths, or they've been told stories about individuals even. Um, but the, prob- the problem is that those, the, those frames can end up making a difference. And, and in fact, we actually did, we haven't managed to publish, publish this yet. But we've had rapid funding from the National Science Foundation to conduct a longitudinal survey. And one of the things we've been, and we've been tracking reactions to this real-time emergency in a group of Americans starting back uh, more than a year ago, back in mid-February of 2020. Um, If I can ask, was that intentionally started when, when there was news of this emerging pandemic or was that coincidental? (laughs) 
Um, it was started on, it was started, we, uh, rapid funding, you can get funding within just a few days um, mm. with a grant proposal. And so we saw um, in the news, we saw this news happening in China of this, of this weird virus that's, that was, that was growing. And what we thought we were going to be doing with rapid funding um, is tracking Americans' reactions to what was going on over there. Mm, to the news. And, and exactly. And in the end, it was, you know, it's all of our lives and the world shut down. And it, it's been very, very interesting. A demonstration one th- perhaps of the importance of just doing open-ended research with the possibility of gaining new insights that were unexpected. Well, and also, you know, big, huge kudos to the National Science Foundation for being willing to fund this kind of research and to be able and to be willing to fund it in a very quick efficient fashion so that you can actually get out in front of something that happens to be emerging on the fly. Yeah. Well done Um, all around actually. Yeah, no, they they are, they're amazing. One of the things that we asked about, and this is related to your question about framing. um, One of the questions we were asking everybody, and this is over time, is we asked them, well, you know, how often are you looking at numbers in the news essentially Um, whether they're on graphs or they're, they're just case numbers um, and they, they were allowed to say, you know, anything from once a week down to, I don't know, like every hour or something. I forget exactly how, how the scale worked. But what we found was that um, uh, by, by e- even in mid-February, about half of, half of the Americans we were studying reported spending at least some time every day looking at, at coronavirus statistics. And that increased up to 90% by about... I think it was about the end of April, who are looking at the numbers each and every day. And consistent with that question of yours, consistent with that question about the effects of negative framing, people who who sought out, who went after, who tracked those numbers more, they were more worried and they thought they were more likely to get COVID-19. We don't know for sure that looking more at the statistics, and again, these are negatively framed statistics for the most part, we don't know for sure that looking at those statistics more caused the increased fear. It could also be that fearful people were driven more to look more at the statistics. We're not positive about that, but we can definitely watch that tracking over time of, of, of this tracking of statistics and the negative emotion that seems to be emerging from it. Well, we'll look forward to the results of that study then. Yeah, Thanks. So at the beginning of section three, you lay out a thesis that I think is pretty interesting and perhaps subtle, that numerate people make better decisions when numbers are involved, primarily not necessarily because of their equipment, their ability to process numbers, but because of their habits. Could you build out this thesis? Yeah. So people who are highly numerate, go figure, they're better at calculations. But they also seem to have this really interesting set of habits when it comes to to numbers. Um, People who are less numerate sometimes can do the same number operations, but they simply don't because they don't have the same habits. There seems to be um, this kind of critical dispositional nature of numeracy that's probably caused by the highly numerate um, having, um, because they know numbers and number operations better, they have chronically greater what's called cognitive access to number knowledge structures. <clears throat> and the, the, the habits that we've ended up seeing in research studies include things from um, earlier attention to numbers and decision tasks, looking relatively longer at important numbers, uh, transforming numbers more. So like in framing tasks, it looks like people who are highly numerate, they might be told 90% survival. But they more, not, maybe not automatically, but they transform the number and they, they also have um, uh, more access to the idea, oh, that's 10% mortality, because of course they're logically the same. But it's the highly numerate who have that habit, that habit of transforming numbers. Uh, another habit that, that um, highly numerate people seem to have is uh, comparing numbers. People who are less numerate are perfectly capable of comparing numbers, but experimental studies suggest that Um, Even though they're perfectly capable of doing it, they might not do it unless directed, whereas the highly numerate have it as a a habit. This, you mentioned briefly something that I loved in the book, this phrase, uh, or this, you described that one thing more numerate people can do with with the information they have is create new information from it. For instance, converting a percentage or a raw number to a percentage um, or some other such numerical transformation. And I thought that was a, a um, a good term, a useful term. In chapter eight, uh, you end this section with a discussion of circumstances in which highly numerate people nevertheless can make poor decisions. And in particular, this discussion of motivated reasoning raises the question of whether accuracy is in fact always our primary goal when we're making decisions. So could you describe some of the evidence here and your interpretation of it? Yeah, so 
you know, so, sometimes math problems are difficult even for highly numerate people. And so that's one way that they can have difficulty with numbers. And it could be things like Bayes' theorem or cumulative risks. There, there's a number of things. But sometimes um, there's an answer we want to hear or want to read. And particularly perhaps, um, and especially these days with politically divisive risk issues. And with them, um, there's kind of two competing numeracy predictions that exist. If a decision maker's goal is accuracy, then more numerate people should behave like scientists. They should look at the data, they should understand the data, and they should use that data so that risk perceptions, for example, converge on the facts, regardless of what your political, regardless of what your political background is. Um, and th the less numerate might rely instead, um, if they don't understand the numbers, they might rely instead on other things like their political attitudes or their feelings or um, just some compelling story they've heard recently in the news. And, and they'll use those as kind of mental shortcuts to figure out how much risk they perceive. Um, what we ended up finding um, in, in, in one study in particular, and I can tell you about some other studies too, if you're interested, is it looks like we're, the, the goal is just simply not always accuracy. So if the goal was, so um, people who are more liberal tend to perceive more risk from things like climate change, for example, and people who are more conservative tend to perceive less risk. Uh, if it were the fact that, um, that, that accuracy was our goal, then people who are highly numerate, they should converge together so that um, whether they're conservative or liberal, they should perceive about the same risk from climate change because they're using the science. And then the people who are less numerate might be the ones who are sort of more influenced by their political ideology. What we see is the opposite. So everybody, you know, in general, across, across numeracy, people who are more liberal, in fact, do perceive more risk from climate change and people who are um, more conservative perceive less risk. But it's particularly true for people who are good at math. Um, what we did, what we think happens is that um, accuracy is really important when that when the end goal is something that you're getting for yourself, um, like like if you're faced with that with a health risk, for example, you, you you want accuracy. You want to be able to make sure you're taking the appropriate health actions, or in finances, you want to make sure you're, you're you know you're you're choosing the right investment strategy. And accuracy is very important there. But when it comes to risk perceptions of things like climate change or nuclear power or gun control, there. What's good for you might not necessarily be getting it right. It might instead be believing how others like you believe, being part of a tribe and staying part of that tribe. And so what we think happens is that people who are high in numeric ability, they might actually use that numeric ability in order to see what they want to see in the data. And so they're, they are motivated and they think through the data and they think through the facts in a motivated fashion that gets them towards a different goal, which is to remain part of their tribe, whether liberal or more conservative. So working out, returning to the discussion of consequences, because this is ultimately why we care about the effect of the numeracy on our decision making. You spell this out in much greater detail in chapter nine. So to begin with, can you describe some ways that numeracy impacts our financial lives? Oh, sure. Yeah, there's some great examples actually out there. So th there's a study that was done, I believe it was done in England. Um, and in this, one in this one particular study of people who are 50 and older, so it's a, particular, it's a particular age group, and they had both spouses answer numeracy questions, and then they, met, and then they had them self-report, well, how much wealth do you have? And when both spouses answered three out of three numeracy questions correctly, their household wealth was about $1.7 million dollars. Okay, so 1.7 million if they answered both all three questions correctly. When neither spouse answered any questions correctly, household wealth was only about $200,000. It was substantially, substantially less. And that's controlling for other aspects of intelligence and other, and, and other demographic kinds of variables. Um, there's another study, um, people who had, uh, it, this, this happened to be among men only, uh, men who had the highest numerical ability in the group, um, they were almost two and a half times more likely to be in the highest wealth group rather than the lowest. While um, men um, with the worst numerical ability within the sample, they were over six times more likely to be found in the lowest wealth group rather than in the highest. And so it look, and again, these are controlling for different, different other aspects of non-numerical intelligence. And then you just see other things. You see that the people who are less numerate 
um, not only do they differ quite a bit in, in wealth from the people who are more numerate, but they're more likely to default on mortgage loans. Um, they're, they're more likely to overdraw their bank accounts. They're less likely to save and, and even plan for retirement. And so you see a, a variety of different um, financial behaviors and financial outcomes in the end um, that are associated with numeracy controlling for these other aspects of intelligence. Now, numeracy impacting our finances is serious, but it's also not necessarily very surprising. It's less obvious, though you've talked about it before earlier in the discussion, how numeracy can impact our health decisions. So what does the research tell us here? Yeah, so um, when it comes to health, there's a lot of ways that, that numbers end up mattering. Um, you have to do things like schedule appointments, get to them on time. Um, what, one of the big ones that's been studied, one of the big ones Big ones that's been that have been studied is using medications appropriately, including their their timing and their dosage. Um, you know, so so with um, with diabetes, for example, we talked about the idea that they often have to titrate their medication um, uh, and and calculate. Uh, other patients have to calculate how to switch from one dose to another and on a particular timing. So so medica- taking medication is actually surprising, surprisingly numeric, depending upon um, what the medication is. Um, other things you have to do, if you, if you think about going into a doctor's appointment, um, they, they often ask you to estimate um, how often you've experienced headaches or some other symptom. So you, you actually have to estimate a count. Um, you have to count or estimate calories consumed or burned through exercise if you're trying to lose weight, for example. Or if you're a diabetic, you often just have to do those kinds of tasks all the time. Uh, if you think about um, health insurance, here in the U.S., uh, we have health insurance. And making good use of health insurance requires understanding some really heavily numeric premiums and deductibles and copayments. And, and so health in the end is highly numeric. It's surprisingly so. Now, in our email exchanges, you shared with me an opinion piece you co-wrote for the Washington Post a couple of years ago, which takes us exactly where I want to go next. You write there, if people, quote, have poorer math skills that don't support their numeric confidence, they may make mistakes that go unnoticed and suffer the consequences. For those that are lower in numeric confidence, having good math skills makes little difference to their health or finances, presumably because they fail to try. Can you elaborate on this? How common is it that we mismatch our skills and our confidence and how does it matter in both directions? Yeah, so so what we ended up doing is we we did two studies. We had a study in finances and we had a study in in health. Um, The the personal finances were self-reported financial outcomes. In health, it had to do with physician reports of disease activity among a set of chronic disease patients. So two very, very different studies, but we were studying the same hypothesis. And what we were interested in was the idea that um, and it goes back to, you might remember the two measures, two of the measures that we talked about early on. We had objective numeracy measures, and then we had subjective numeracy measures. And in particular, we talked about, I, I mentioned at least briefly, the idea of numeric self-efficacy or numeric confidence, how much confidence you have in your math ability. And what we were interested in was the idea that while well, past studies have said that more objective numeracy is better for health and finances and more numeric self, um, self-efficacy or more numeric confidence, let me put it that way, more numeric confidence is also better for, for both um, health and finances. We thought that there might actually be what's called an interaction. What we thought might happen was that um, that people who are very good at their at, at, in math, so they, they knew how to do math, they knew how to do calculations, they probably had some of those habits we talked about earlier. Um, that among those people, some of them are high in numeric confidence and some are low. But confidence is associated um, in the psychology literature, that confidence is associated with whether you persist in a task or not. And so the idea would be that someone with high numeric confidence, regardless of their ability, that they should be the people um, who are more likely to just keep on going on, even when uh, a, ma- a, a numeric task is, is boring, it's arduous, it's even scary, that someone who has more confidence, they're going to be more willing to push through that, um, even, even when like troubles come up with it. And so if you're high in ability and high in numeric confidence, then you should persist and you have the abilities to, to support that persistence. So you should do particularly well. But if you're high in ability and have low confidence, then you may not persist as much. And as a result, you may not do as well, even though you have the same ability. So, so we see that on the one hand. But then let's think about the people who have low numeric ability. So they're low in objective numeracy. Some of them, nonetheless, think they're kind of God's gift to math because that's what happens. We have people who are overconfident. And 
if they're highly confident, then again, despite regardless of their ability, we think that they're the, that they're going to persist when it comes to numeric tasks. They're going to go ahead and try. They're going to go ahead and persist, even when it gets hard or boring. But the problem is they don't have the ability to support the persistent activities they're taking on, and they may make mistakes. They may not recognize the mistakes because you need ability to recognize mistakes. And therefore, someone with low ability and high confidence, we think that they're going to do the worst. And in fact, we see that general pattern um, across both studies. So, so that um, when it comes to um, self-reported financial outcomes, but also the disease activity of chronic disease patients, what you see is that people who are high in confidence, they do really well if they're uh, high in ability, but they do quite poorly if they're low in ability. And the people who are low in confidence, it's almost like their math ability doesn't matter. And it makes sense from a persistence standpoint because they never try to use them. They don't have the, they lack the confidence and therefore they don't try to use them. So you get this very, very interesting pattern. And in terms of, of um, sort of, of, of how common is that in, in, in one of the samples that we used in the larger sample on financial, um, in, on financial outcomes, if we break our sample in half based on objective numeracy, and then we also separately break it in half in terms of numeric confidence, if you can kind of picture that. So we have four, we have four groups now where, where we've, broken, <coughs> we've broken each measure in half independently. And then we combine them together to see who's in each of those four groups. What we see is that about 35% of the people are low in both numeric confidence and numeric ability. Again, about 35% were high on both. And then about 15% each uh, were mismatched into the other two groups. So, mm. Elegant symmetry there, at least between the um, the groups where these were aligned or better calibrated, and the groups in which they weren't. Yeah, and fortunately, there are more people in the calibrated groups that tend to do better in right. life. Now, something else you do throughout the book that I very much appreciate is identify outstanding questions and directions for future research. You devote chapter ten to these research gaps, and specifically what we don't yet know about causality. So. In your view, what are some of the most urgent experiments that have not yet been done? Yeah, so I think that idea of causal studies is, is the most critical. Um, we need more experimental studies that increase some type of numeracy in one group and does not increase it in another group. And people are randomly assigned to one or the other of these, of these groups. And then um, examine outcomes on risk perceptions and decisions and life outcomes. There are a couple of studies out there, but it's hard to do. We don't have good measures, not measures, we don't have good interventions to quickly and efficiently increase numeric ability in adults. And, and, that's, and that's, what we, that's what we need to be able to show these causal studies. It doesn't necessarily have to be quick, but the minute you have an intervention that takes longer, you're, let, you're going to get fewer and fewer studies in it. So I think those causal studies in numeracy are critically important. Going back to the study we were talking about a minute ago, um, causal studies in calibrating numeric ability with numeric confidence is also important because you don't want to... Um, so for example, you, you can increase numeric confidence more easily than increasing numeric ability, but you could end up accidentally creating all of these people who are overconfident about their math ability. They, make, they try tasks because they're persisting, but they make mistakes and don't recognize it, and they do worse as a result. You don't want, it, you don't want that. So getting some causal studies and calibrating numeric ability with numeric confidence is, is a second one that I would point to. So we've gone through the first half of the book, which on my reading seemed like um, – the part focusing on meaning, the meaning of numeracy and the scope of innumeracy, and now we're jumping into the second half, as I saw it, where we learned um, more about how we acquire our numeric tools and how we can hone them. Section, is that fair to think of the book as divided into those two halves? Yeah, for the most part. I think you're right. I mean, okay. the, everything sort of, the, the, the ideas of objective numeracy in particular go throughout the book. Um, but I think you're right, the, the kind of emergence of it. And then what do we do to help people who are, who are currently less numerate, either short term or long term? Right. We've talked, we talked briefly at the beginning of the discussion about our uh, approximate number sense. And so Section 5 moves into the origins and development of this, of this number sense. So from, I guess my question is, how is it measured again? And what do we know about its relationship to our objective numeracy? 
Yeah. So, okay. So this is going back to that, appro that, that approximate number system. And so th there are a few different measures that people use in the literature. The one that is conceptually the closest to the approximate number system um, are, are these, um, they're, they're called dot discrimination tasks. Um, and they, they don't involve symb symbolic numbers. In case, it, it, instead, what people are doing, um, participants are responding to a relatively large number of trials of dots. And so you'll have a set of blue dots, for example, on the screen and a set of yellow dots. And they're presented too rapidly for people to actually count the dots, but they have to indicate whether there are more blue dots or yellow dots on each, on each, um, on each trial. Um, and what ends up happening is you, you have them do, it's a very carefully designed study. They go through a long number of trials, probably not long enough in the original version of it because it's not quite reliable enough, but you probably need like 300 trials um, to, um, for good reliability on a task like this. And then you can model people's correct and incorrect responses to how whether there's more blue dots or more yellow dots and come up with co what's called a Weber fraction. And that um, then relates to the precision with which people are representing magnitudes in the approximate number system. And so that, that's, the, that's probably the conceptually closest. Um, it can also be measured with something that's called a symbolic number mapping task or more simply a line task. This comes um, from um, uh, John Opfer, uh, who's a developmental psychologist. And th this is a much, much simpler task to give people. And so it's probably used a little bit more often in decision tasks. Um, here, what people are given um, are, th they'll be given a symbolic number, like an Arabic integer 21, let's say. And they're asked to place a tick mark on a line from zero to 1,000 to indicate where, where does 21 fall. And then they're asked about 780, and then they're asked about 71, and then they're asked about something else. And um, what you do is you model the responses in either linear or logarithmic um, fashion, and you you end up with um, the, the absolute deviations between each response on that zero to one thousand line and the objective number. This measure is not a direct measure of the ANS. It in, it involves um, it involves the ANS, but you also have to map symbolic numbers onto the numerical magnitudes in memory. So it's a somewhat confounded um, a somewhat confounded measure, but it gets closer to decision making because it has symbolic numbers. And that's what decisions usually have. They have symbolic numbers. And so it's one of the measures that's used pretty often. Mm. So a direct link in that sense between an instrument used to measure our approximate number sense or innate number sense, but that has a component of the system, the symbols that we need to use in everyday life to deal with numbers. Exactly. So it just gets a little bit closer. And, and you asked earlier about the, the relationship to objective numeracy. People who have a more precise sense of number in this approximate number sense, they tend to be more numerate. In fact, you can even look mm -hmm. at school, you can even look at school children, um, kids who are, whose, appro whose approximate number sense was um, assessed, I think during kindergarten it was. If you then look at their math ability by grade one, They've improved their the, those who have the more acute sense, the more precise approximate number sense. They improve more in their math abilities by the next grade, and so you see this linkage um, both correlationally among adults and kids, but then you also see it prospectively in children. Um, so it's a very it's a really really interesting system. We don't know nearly enough about it in terms of decision making. There's there's only sort of a handful, may, maybe more than that, maybe a dozen studies that have been done. But it's a very very interesting system. Um, continuing this theme, chapter 12 examines the origins of numeracy differences, both inheritance and education. And on my reading, the key takeaway was that a better understanding of both of these can help us improve the one we have control over. Is that fair? Yeah, I, th I think that is fair. I'll, you know, but partially I was just doing that because every I, I talked about both of them because everybody asks about, is it just genetic? And it is not just genetic. And so I, I think really I, you know, from, from my perspective, I included the I included the, the inheritance portion in order to show, yes, there's some effect there, but there's also this huge effect of education itself. And everybody can learn math. And yes, you can too. That was sort of my that was really sort of in the back of my head, my purpose behind behind including that section. And it comes through clearly. Um, you also discussed some of the potential um, needs in formal education. And I wonder if you could speak to that here. Yeah, so it, you know, in terms of in terms of formal education, um, it really comes it comes down to two things. First, you get the biggest bang for your buck with math education with little ones. 
you know, um, you, you don't want to miss critical learning periods. You, you, you get these critical learning periods in development. And anytime a child learns um, master skills earlier, it makes later learning easier. Because otherwise, if you don't master those skills earlier and suddenly you're, you're hit with more difficult things to learn when you haven't really learned those earlier skills yet, you just get further behind. And so we want early education to create um, what, what, I'll, what, what I'll call the, these positive feedback loops for kids so that you know, they, they, learn the early, they, they learn the early easy stuff that leads to greater math confidence. And then that's what allows them um, to go on and to conquer what are increasingly difficult problems. And so you, you want to support children's math uh, ability, but you also want to support their math confidence so that you can get this kind of positive feedback loop going. And then the, the second need in formal education um, is completely related to this. It's the idea of reducing math anxiety to support learning. Um, that you know, there's a lot of math there's a lot of math anxiety out there among kids as well as adults, for that matter. Um, and the math anxious tend to avoid math math courses and math content more than those who are those people who aren't as math anxious. But this avoidance then causes them to learn even less and to perform even less well. So you, you want to reduce social contagion of math anxiety from teachers and parents, because there's data suggesting that there is this kind of contagion that teachers and parents both can accidentally communicate math anxiety to their kids. Um, and you don't want that math anxiety to block math learning. And so reducing math anxiety, I'd say, is, the, is one of the other great needs in formal education. Now, section six, which continues these themes, details other ways we understand numbers beyond the approximate number system. And I was delighted to learn that our acute number sense might be better understood as logarithmic than as linear. So I wonder if you could briefly explain the reasons and the implications of this. Yeah. So the, the approximate number system is it's a perceptual phenomenon. This is not something that we think through. This is this is just how we perceive um, magnitudes in the world around us um, and in ways, again, that we share with other species. Um, it, it's again, it's just it's a super interesting system in these perceptual comparisons. What they think happens is that um, we, we perceive numeric magnitude in an inexact way. So if you think about um, perceiving the number seven. What they think happens is that there's this um, clipped Gaussian distribution of, 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 of magnitudes that sort of exist in your head. You don't think about it, but when you see a number seven, you know almost instantaneously that it's about a seven. A little less likely it might be, you know, it, it might be a six or an eight, a little less likely than that, it might be a, a five or a nine, but you get this interesting clipped Gaussian distribution. And then when numbers are close together, those clipped Gaussian distributions overlap and you get confused between them. You're not positive whether it's a five or a seven, for example. But if the numbers are further apart, let's say a five and an 11, those, those distributions of, of, of that, that representation of magnitude in your head, they're far enough apart that the, the distribution of your representation, it doesn't overlap as much. So you can tell immediately, oh, 11, of course, bigger than five. But surprisingly, numbers that are close together, like a five and a six, it takes us a little bit longer to tell which one's bigger. It's really very, very interesting. And then there's another thing that happens on top of that. Um, so, so that first one is called the distance effect. Things that are closer together are a little harder, even though they're next to each other on the number line, they're a little harder to tell apart in terms of which one's bigger. The next, the next effect is called the size effect. And it's the idea that as we get into bigger and bigger numbers, um, there's a compression of the number line, and it can be caused for one of two reasons. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk about one of them. Um, but essentially, as numbers get bigger and bigger, in terms of how we represent them, they get closer together, so that even with the same clipped Gaussian distribution of, of magnitudes, they overlap more because in our minds the numbers get more and more compressed the bigger they are. And so that seems to be um, that, that that that's kind of the underlying structure of this approximate number system. Um, and it's why it's harder for us to tell numbers that are, um, how far apart numbers are when they're big numbers than if they're small numbers. And so like an implication, an implication of that, for example, um, and this is like a really just concrete, um, how people react to prices. If you imagine, imagine going to a store and you're going to, and you're going to um, purchase a $20 calculator um, and you're going to get $10 off if you drive a little further. And the question is, would you drive? Well, how far apart are 
$20 and the $10 off you'd get. Or think about a different one, a similar situation. You could save the same $10, so it's exactly the same number if you drove if you drove further, but now you're purchasing a $2,000 leather jacket for $1,990. How far apart are they? And is that $10 worth it? There's a huge difference in our perceptions between those things, even though the absolute $10 difference is exactly the same. And it seems to be because of our approximate number system that Again, when we're trying just quickly, intuitively to tell how far apart are two numbers, and in this case, does how far apart they are make it worthwhile for me to drive further, numbers that are very big seem much closer together than numbers that are very small. I'm going to try to wrap this up a little quickly. Um, Some of the material I was going to ask about Section 7, we've already discussed a bit earlier in, uh, in, in the interview. But one thing I did want to definitely ask is, Among the several strategies you survey for communicating information grounded in numbers, are there one or two that you think are most important to spotlight? Yeah. So, you know, I think the biggest one that I would spotlight um, is the idea that we we over, and we talked about this too, we overestimate how facile people are with numbers. We overestimate their numeric ability. Um, And so the thing that I think is probably most important is to reduce cognitive effort and do the math for people when you're, when you're presenting numbers. And we often don't do that. And so I I wrote recently, um, I think in a, in a piece for the conversation, if I recall, um, I wrote recently about a tweet that came out from the New York Times. And this is going to go back to our discussion on framing effects, by the way. Um, So the New York Times tweeted out, and this is a quote from the tweet, nearly half of New York City voters know someone who died of COVID-19. 74% of white voters said they did not know someone who died from coronavirus, but 48% of black voters and 52% of Latino voters said they did know someone who died from coronavirus. Notice that some of those statistics referred to knowing someone and others to not knowing someone, and they mixed them up in the same sentence. But this mixture of frames is confusing because people, you're you're requiring more cognitive effort from people to figure out what the heck is going on there. And what the New York Times should have said is they should have said 26% of white voters said they knew someone who died. And so did 48% of black voters and 52% of Latino voters. When you do the math for people and you provide that easy comparability across across groups, it just makes it so much easier to understand and use information. And that's just one example of how to reduce cognitive effort. There's lots of other ways um, of doing it, but that, that, that general idea of reducing cognitive effort, I think, is, is critical. I feel like there's been a lot of discussions from journalists reflecting on their communication styles and a lot of recognition lately of the importance of doing the work for the reader and this seems to fit really squarely within that conversation. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think absolutely. I think that we. Um, it, it goes back to the idea that as as communicators, whether we're communicating to our friends, or I'm communicating to you, or a journalist is communicating out to the world, we often overestimate how well we communicate because we're often not really getting feedback to tell us how good or bad that we're doing. And I think what what journalists are doing is they're starting to recognize, oh, okay, we are getting some feedback on this now. And we know that there are some strategies that we can use to try to, to try to reduce the effort that our readers have to take and just to make things easier so that I, as a communicator, can communicate to you as a listener much better. So the book builds up very naturally to Section 8 on improving numeracy. Since you review interventions on each type of numeracy in Chapter 18, where do you see the greatest return on investment? Oh, honestly, um, long-term formal schooling for little ones. Again, biggest bang for your buck among preschoolers. Um, but in, but continuing that long, long-term formal schooling, um, supporting math confidence again, um, you know, and I would say just generally getting more formal education um, uh, simply because it increases general intelligence, including numeric intelligence. Um, if you specifically focus on long ter- long-term formal objective numeracy education, that's going to likely be the most impactful method for improving objective numeracy. Any any time you need deep learning of a subject, and and when it comes to math, you need deep learning. You need to um, you need to know what the rule is, and then you need to practice it. And you, you it needs to in, in a sense become part of you, so that it can become a habit, so that you will use it. Um, but anytime you need that kind of deep learning, it requires practice, and practice with concentrated effort and with concentrated feedback. Now, a couple of points in the book, you contrast our 
societally relaxed attitudes towards innumeracy with the powerful social stigma against illiteracy. And I'd very much like to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, sure. Uh, Let me ask you a question first. Did you know that many more people have adequate literacy than have adequate numeracy? Because I think that's one of the key things. Not before reading your book. Yeah, okay. So, you know, there, there are a number of different samples, but I'll tell you about one study in particular um, that found that 99% of people had adequate literacy skills, but only 17% of the same sample had better than ninth grade numeracy skills. And across studies, these kinds of differences are pretty common. And I think that difference might be what sort of drives these relaxed attitudes because people think, well, a lot of people aren't any good at math, so it's okay if I'm not. And so it, it sort of, I think that difference kind of allows us, um, allows people to think it's okay to not be good at math. And then you see, you know, there, there's lots of, of quotes from people, whether it's in the movies, um, oh, I never was any good at arithmetic, but I'm never going to use it anyway. Or even, believe it or not, from uh, Michelle Obama, um, the, the then first lady, Michelle Obama, kind of laughed about not being any good with numbers. And I remember hearing her and thinking, no, you of all people do not communicate this. <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's, math is hard. It takes a lot of effort. Um, people don't always want to take a lot of effort. But the research says it's really important to have good objective numeracy kinds of skills. Um, and it's important, not just in the math classroom, but it crawls out of the math classroom out into your daily life. And I think the book as a whole does a good job of pointing out this discrepancy without suggesting that we should have a greater stigma uh, or treat people worse for being a numerate or having less numeracy, but rather to really focus more attention on improving numeracy, both individuals and as a society. I cannot tell you how happy I am that ca- that, that came across because I would never want to increase stigma on, on a particular group. You know, it's more about improving our systems, improving our systems of education, improving our systems short term, improving our systems of communicating numbers so that even if someone can't take another math class in their lifetime or just simply they're not willing to, nonetheless, you can present numbers to them in ways that, that help them in that, that decrease disparities that exist across our society. So to begin wrapping up, I wonder if you could share a piece of scholarship or media that you think makes a good companion to yours. Gosh, so um, I have to say, I saw this question of yours, and I wasn't quite sure how to how to answer it, but I can tell you about people. How about that? I can tell you about researchers. Absolutely. So w- when it comes to measurement, um, measurement of objective numeracy or subjective numeracy, there are people like Isaac Lipkis, um, Edward Coakley, Angie Fagerlin, uh, John Opfer for the for the approximate number system. When um, when it comes to studies of numeracy, objective numeracy in decision making, um, Ed Coakley and his collaborator Rocio Garcia Radamero um, are very very good. Have done some very interesting work. There's some really interesting young researchers out of Poland right now. I have to say I haven't had a chance to meet them yet, but I'm looking forward to it someday post pandemic. Um, and I'm going to butcher their names. My apologies to you in case you're listening. But Jacob Trazik and Agata Sobka Sobkow. Again, my apologies if I butchered them, butchered them. We can link them in the show notes and people can find them quite easily from there. Perfect. I do know how to spell them. Um, there's also work on decision competencies by Wendy Brun de Brun and um, some great work on dual process theories by separately by Keith Stanovich and Valerie Reyna. So lots You're- of people. There's some tremendous researchers out there working in this part of the field or at the edges of it. As a final question, what projects are you working on now? Oh, you know, so I have some great people in my lab and as collaborators. They're not always in my lab. Um, we're working on a variety of things. Uh, right now with Par Bjalkebring in Sweden, I'm looking at the effects. We're looking at the effects of objective numeracy on people's reported financial well-being and overall well-being. Some very, very interesting stuff. Um, with some others in my lab, uh, we're looking at the mood inducing effects of doing math problems and what implications that has for um, for uh, for decision making. Um, we're still looking at some research, looking at trying to improve numeracy in the classroom, trying to come up with some of those methods where you can improve numeric ability more quickly, um, maybe by taking advantage of a math classroom. If anyone out there is interested in research like that and being a collaborator, feel free to get in touch. Um, and uh, you know, with Gretchen Chapman at, at, um, Carnegie Mellon, we're looking at how should we present big numbers like budget numbers? Cause that's really important to being a good citizen in our society.
Uh, it's a whole variety of things. And does that research in classroom, in improving classroom numeracy, have potential to assist with these causal studies that you think need to be conducted? That's exactly right. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to improve numeracy in the classroom. And then at the end of the class, um, we actually insert our experiments. We look at um, we look at decision studies. We look at financial outcomes, health outcomes. And then we look to see if our intervention worked in terms of improving objective numeracy. Does it also work in terms of improving decision making and outcomes like health behaviors, for example? So that, that's exactly what we do. That's That's the purpose of it. Very cool. I've been talking with Dr. Ellen Peters, author of the new book, A Numeracy in the Wild, Misunderstanding and Misusing Numbers, published in 2020 by Oxford University Press. Ellen, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much.